Good morning and welcome to Global Perspectives. I'm David Dumke. Today I'm joined by the Consul General of Germany in Miami, Andre Siegel. Welcome to the show. Hello, thank you for having me. Well, I wanted to, wanted to start by asking you a little about what the consulate in Miami is, does and kind of how how did you end up there? You have a long diplomatic career. Well, yes, I've been working in the diplomatic uh, service for Germany for about 30 years now. And my first foreign assignment was the U.S. and my last is uh, here because I, afterwards I'm going to retire. Uh, but, um, yeah, well, what we do we do? We are, um, of course, catering for our German population, the German nationals. We have about 250,000 German citizens living in Florida, many of them dual citizens. So lots of consular work uh, in that respect. And my main task as a consul general is to uh, promote good uh, bilateral and transatlantic relations in all walks of life, political, economic, cultural, academic. And that's why I'm here today also at uh, uh, International Inter Education Week at UCF. Well, appreciate you being here. Uh, I, w I want to start by talking about some contemporary issues. The biggest one in Europe, of course, right now is the ongoing uh, conflict in the Ukraine. Um, could you tell me, tell us about Germany's position on, on the conflict and where you see things are headed? Well, uh, first of all, I wouldn't describe it as a conflict. It's an invasion sure. of a uh, bully, Russia, uh, of a smaller nation in the neighborhood, Ukraine. And, well, for Germany, uh, this has been a big paradigm shift, I would say, on a number of policy areas because Germany uh, had a good economic partnership with Russia for the time being, before the war uh, started, and in particular imported uh, gas from Russia, which constituted about, uh, well, 50% of German gas imports, gas being about a 10% uh, part of German energy mix altogether. Uh, so it makes a difference whether you have that or you don't. Um, and as you may remember, Nord Stream 2, the two pipelines passing through the Baltic Sea, have been a big um, bone of contention for a while. Uh, and immediately after the invasion of Russia or Ukraine, German government decided to stop any further project uh, <clears throat> importing gas from Russia via that uh, pipeline and basically ending up uh, saying that under these conditions we cannot uh, import any more gas uh, for, from Russia at all. Another policy area which, which changed or had to change was uh, security policy uh, because uh, until then Germany had been um, still after, uh, after World War II had been uh, sort of under the European and NATO umbrella, protected, uh, and under the impression that this is now a peace after German unification and the end of the Iron Curtain in particular. Uh, but this uh, sort of fragrant um, sort of throwback for 100 years by Putin, um, beyond everything international law and uh, all the treaties that Russia has signed, uh, that had sort of an, a strong impact on German policy in the way that uh, the German government pledged a creation of a special fund for uh, creating defense capabilities in Germany and for NATO, uh, and uh, also to change its arms export policy, uh, which until then uh, was um, sort of restraining uh, exports to areas of conflict uh, quite, quite a lot. Uh, but with Ukraine being in need of, uh, of massive support, uh, Germany decided also to get rid of that rule and to, to be able to help Ukraine as we do currently, for example, with a very affected air defense uh, system, which has uh, helped a lot through the past few months. This is a quite significant change in German policy. Yes. And particularly, you know, Germany, as, as, as you know, was in, involved in Afghanistan um, in sending your military there. 
Is Germany, does this mark a, a moment when Germany is going to be more assertive in, in global affairs, not just diplomatically, but with, with when necessary with your, your military forces? Well, uh, Germany has always, uh, after Second World War, of course, uh, has developed a very strong um, multilateral uh, sort of uh, feeling and, and policy was stimulated by multilateralism. To begin with, German, uh, Franco-German friendship after centuries of arch enemy. Uh, we, we work very well together with France. Uh, and this is sort of the basic uh, axis also to, uh, to find compromise within the European Union. So as we export 50, more than 50% uh, of our goods into the European Union, of course, Germany is interested in maintaining the cohesion of the European Union and to keep that together. Um, but this uh, invasion of the Ukraine was, of course, um, a confirmation of what a number of people had said before that Germany, uh, in addition to being a soft power, an economic power, needed uh, to realize that uh, it needed to stand up also for the hard things in life and build up a hard power as well. So part of the Ukraine war, as you, you outlined, was Germany's energy uh, needs. And you, a lot was coming from, of gas supply was coming from Russia. Yes. What are the, where has Germany turned? I know some coal plants have been restarted, but where has Germany turned for their energy needs? Um, we're going into winter, of course, um, so the energy needs will increase, and that's for one year. But what, if this this war goes on uh, for a long time, will Germany um, permanently change their energy mix? Well, as, as you may know, um, there was a big decision under the Merkel government in 2011 to have a conversion of energy towards uh, possibly climate neutral energy and to get out also of nuclear energy. Um, and now this is a little bit modified, is being a little bit modified right now, but Germany is sticking to its commitment to the, the COP27 and the, the, uh, the general process to, to become climate neutral by 2045. So first of all, uh, we have strengthened the renewable energy component. Uh, at the moment, as we speak, uh, German energy consumption is provided by 55% from renewable energies. I think that's quite high for uh, comparable inter 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 industrialized countries. But the immediate uh, consequence of this crisis, of course, has to be uh, to reduce energy consumption. So there are different measures in place to, uh, for this winter to, to overcome this gap with lacking uh, gas from, from Russia. And uh, one positive development is that we were able to fill up the uh, gas reservoirs, tanks, um, up to 99%, uh, actually. And they were empty in the summer, uh, up down to about 40%. Uh, so that was a big, big effort. And that was, has been able to, to be implemented because new providers came in from uh, the Maghreb countries, from, uh, from Spain, from Norway, uh, from Qatar, among others. Uh, and there are new uh, contracts being, being made. And fundamental decision has also been made, which is to install LNG, liquid gas uh, terminals, so that Germany can also take advantage of that which is, uh, of course, a good uh, step uh, in renewing and, and uh, improving still commercial relations with the United States as well. So is there a, da a danger uh, or a lesson to be learned by, you know, Germany has been a big proponent of trade for, for, for years. It's been a real boon to your, your economy. Is there a lesson to be learned with the Ukrainian situation on relying on one source or making sure that you have the options of going to multi-sources. We're talking about German energy needs now, but it's also a lot of food needs of countries that are friendly to Germany and, and others. Yeah. Well, I think already during the pandemic, we've learned the lesson that uh, with supply chain problems, uh, we need to diversify uh, our resources. And that has been exacerbated by the Russian uh, crisis right now. 
Uh, and yes, definitely that, and in particular from the German perspective, China comes into the picture with which we have very close economic ties and many German, for example, automobile manufacturers are producing still in China uh, and uh, other tech um, and, and chip manufacturing and so on is, is also playing an important role. Uh, but if you observe sort of the current uh, situation, our chancellor is currently traveling in Southeast Asia. He's been to China, he's been to Vietnam, uh, he's going next to Jakarta to the G20, and he's ending up in Singapore uh, for a big annual conference of uh, the Asia Pacific uh, industry um, to reevaluate the situation. And one of the consequences will certainly be. Yes, we also have to diversify our relations with China and see with the ASEAN countries uh, what we can do uh, more. Uh, and of course, also to look back to our transatlantic partners, Canada, uh, United States, and we are convinced uh, that we can do more there as well. So I want to get into uh, the U.S.-German relations, um, which of course have been very, very close on economic uh, policies and on defense policies, but there has been bumps along the road. There was uh, your Chancellor Schroeder opposed the Iraq war uh, when President George W. Bush uh, opted to to invade Iraq, and then you've you know you've had meetings between Angela Merkel and Donald Trump were were something of legendary status. Um, how are things today? Under the current um, U.S. administration, I think the understanding of the uh, need to cooperate internationally has sort of become uh, very pertinent uh, to, to everyone. And the Russia crisis and the pandemic, I mean, has shown that as well. Uh, we've learned that lesson in Europe uh, in the 1950s with the, uh, uh, when we started with the coal and steel community. That was a revolutionary idea uh, to put together previous enemies like France and Germany and to administrate together a very important, very important raw materials like coal and steel uh, and to create a supranational institution uh, which would manage uh, all of this. And this was the basis for the European Union uh, and, and this entered into the German DNA of today uh, that this uh, sort of voluntarily created interdependence is really a win-win uh, situation for everyone who is cooperating. And that's what our philosophy is of foreign trade, foreign policy, and that we hope uh, that this is understood uh, by others as well. And uh, of course, in, in terms of trade, we need to respect international rules established by the World Trade uh, Organization. And we have a number of little issues and irritations here and there about non-respect of, of rules of protectionism and, and so on. And on the German side, of course, we are uh, sort of trying to, to establish a common understanding that it's mutually beneficial if we play the game according to the rules. You, you mentioned the EU, so I did want to ask about where, you know, how stable is the EU, first of all? You had Brexit, you've had movements in other countries that haven't resulted in countries leaving. Um, but it suggested you know, some fragility there. Um, is the EU, EU strong today? Is it something that's going to be reliable, or do you anticipate if tough economic times come that countries will opt for a more nationalistic approach? Well, that's a very good question, and indeed the times are tough, uh, and the temptation to um, sort of revert to populistic and nationalistic um, ideologies is, is there. But if you look back a little bit, you can see the EU has been confronted in the past 12 years with a number of crises, financial crises, 2008, 2009, uh, big, big problem with Greece and Italy, uh, which were finally solved, uh, migration crises, uh, with, which is still lingering a little bit, the, the, the way we are receiving migrants from different parts of the world. Uh, with Ukraine, there's unanimity. Everyone is, so, is in solidarity of receiving the uh, Ukrainian refugees. As you mentioned, Brexit, that was unexpected and, uh, well, a 
I would call it irrational uh, decision, but we have to live with it, and arrangements have been made to live with it. Uh, and then you, you have the pandemic, and you had the, the Russian, the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine. So all this are, these are enormous uh, problems, which are some internal, some external, um, and, and, and triggered by external factors. And at the same time, we have an institutional setup in the European Union, uh, which is complicated, and not everyone understands it. So in public opinion, it's easier to say, oh, we take a national decision on this issue, and we will resolve this problem. But most of the time, the problems are much more complicated and have a European component, and that you need the other partners of the EU uh, to, to give in. And uh, so I'm optimistic, uh, having studied also at the College of Europe in Bruges and have a postgraduate diploma there, that we will find a way to get around and solve even these very harsh uh, crises that we're going through right now. I wanted to ask, you mentioned Greece and Italy. Um, how does the EU do, deal with a country like Hungary? Well, I had the uh, privilege of learning Hungarian when I uh, entered the forum. I, 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 I'm asking you questions not intentionally based on <laughs> yes. your CV, but I'm glad no, no. I'm asking the right, the right man. <laughs> no, but uh, we have, as in many countries, we have democratic elections. And uh, the current uh, government does not always sort of uh, have the same philosophy than maybe the government that cut uh, the, um, uh, the Iron Curtain in 1989 with uh, Jula Horn at, uh, as uh, Minister President of, of Hungary. That were different times. Uh, but it means also that in a couple of years you have new elections and there may be a new um, a political current that, that is gaining, gaining the elections. So this cannot be sort of the principle of ruling and, and living together with, with the EU. We do have some issues with the um, uh, with, with the rule of law uh, and the established uh, European sort of uh, complexity of, of, uh, of uh, legal regulations, uh, but uh, we, have, we have other problems with other nations. So it's a give and take. And uh, uh, the Commission has certain procedures how to deal with those uh, situations. And I'm confident, uh, as has been the case before, that we'll find solutions there as well. So you're, we're talking about multilateralism, so I have to ask, ask you about NATO. And again, you know, NATO has been a force of stability um, since, since its founding, um, post-World post War II era. Um, but you also had hesitation on the U.S. part within the last decade, obviously, um, threatening to pull out of NATO. Uh, where, do you, where do you see NATO today? Obviously, you have Joe Biden and Donald Trump who had very different positions on it, um, which suggests one thing is, is the U.S. reliable partner in NATO or, or leader of NATO? Um, so just those are some thoughts I'd like to hear yeah. what you have to say on this. Well, I definitely see NATO reinforced by the current uh, crisis and the current Russian invasion because the need is becoming even more obvious to stick together as a, as a transatlantic alliance with the different um, capabilities that we have. We support each other in times of peace already. Uh, Germany, for example, supported uh, uh, any of the, the air defense of Estonia or some other uh, Baltic uh, countries. Different troop movements and stations have been changed uh, after the, the Ukraine crisis, of course. Um, so the coherence among NATO it has been strengthened through this unprovoked and ir totally irrational uh, decision by Putin to invade uh, Ukraine. Of course, there have been discussions about modalities of how to emphasize different aspects of cooperation, but there have, no, have been no discussions about the fundamentals. Uh, Article 5, uh, the mutual um, sort of support of anyone who is attacked will have the automatic support by all the others. And that makes also the difference for Russia. Obviously, they pay very close attention uh, not to infringe upon any centimeter of NATO territory, because that would provoke uh, NATO as a total to react. I do think that uh, one 
necessary step forward will be and has to be to bring EU and NATO closer together because there are also um, EU military um, consultation and policy mechanisms which need to be brought together closely, more closely to the NATO mechanisms. And of course, the membership is not the same. You have different countries being, being members. A key uh, NATO ally which needs to uh, sort of cooperate positively in this is Turkey. Uh, Turkey is, a, is a, a key nation in this current situation. So uh, that would definitely be a, um, a very important step forward if Turkey agreed or could contribute to a rapprochement between NATO and the European Union. So um, in, in talking about NATO and in talking about the EU and talking about the response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it's strengthened both entities as, as, as what you've been saying. The question is how this, this ends. Um, most likely it doesn't appear that, that Vladimir Putin is going anywhere. His sensitive, his chief concern, although, you know, this doesn't justify an invasion of another country, has been about NATO's expansion, which happened despite what he did in Ukraine, in fact, because of it. How do you deal with, with Vladimir Putin? How does Germany deal with Vladimir Putin? Well, we, we've learned it the hard way, but uh, Possibly in Germany we have been a little bit too naive and have been, uh, and the Russian narrative and the different sort of cyber uh, attacks that we've experienced are extremely important so that this narrative has sort of gained some ground also in, in Europe. Uh, and um, so, uh, I mean, some of the things that, that the Russians have said in the beginning, uh, they want to get rid of a fascist and anti-Semitic regime, uh, which is totally ridiculous, knowing that President Zelensky in Ukraine is of Jewish uh, origin, uh, that they want to protect uh, Russian-speaking citizens in the Ukraine. Ridiculous, because the first they bombed were the cities are, that where the Russian Russophones lived in the Ukraines. Uh, and 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 go on, go on, dirty, dirty bomb. The Ukrainians are preparing a dirty bomb. International experts have shown no. The only uh, way to explain this narrative is that the Russians are themselves preparing something and try to present it as something coming from Ukraine. So this false narrative, it, this disinformation is a clear preoccupation which we need to, to, uh, to take into account. And uh, what Russia is doing right now, destroying critical infrastructure in the Ukraine to voluntarily creating humanitarian crises during the cold winter in the Ukraine, uh, this is just unacceptable uh, in a, on a human uh, basis, but also politically. We need to be prepared that this kind of uh, infrastructure uh, attacks could happen also possibly uh, one day in Western Europe. We, we just have a few minutes left, but, but as along we're, what we're, when we're talking about the laundry list of, of some of the actions that the Putin, Putin and his government have taken, another one seems to be meddling in elections, whether it's European elections, which are some evidence of, or U.S. elections. How do you stop that? And can you deal with someone who's an, you know, an actor that's using these kinds of tactics? Um, I, I have a personal opinion on that, which is um, the, Rus the impact of Russian influence in election has been minimal. Uh, even though some of the narratives have been taken up by social media, etc., which is the main way of transporting it, it's social media, uh, which are sometimes disguised as Western media, but aren't. Um, so my advice would be, uh, well, learn to respect professional journalism, uh, learn how to distinguish between fact and comment uh, of the fact. I was brought up in, in Berlin and being able to listen to West German television, East German television, French radio, British and US uh, radio. So I have had the opportunity to, to see, ah, the, the reality is 
something, but the way to present reality can vary in different shades. Uh, and we just have to educate, I think, ourselves uh, to, to be um, sort of media, to, to, to acquire a media competence to deal with this influx of multiple information and to, to pick out what is right. A bigger question outside of the Ukraine context on the global scale. Where does Germany see itself today? Well, Germany, I think, doesn't see itself differently than a year ago or five years ago. Um, the main anchor of Germany is the European Union to be a promoter of European cooperation and integration and to go even further than some would like to, with majority decisions, for example, to be more effective. Also in foreign European policy and security policy. Um, so that's number one. Uh, number two is to, to uh, contribute to international, uh, to peaceful uh, togetherness, um, and that is to help also the poorest country, the least developed countries. We have a, a big, big budget for, for, for that. And, uh, and ensuring that the rule of law is respected by everyone. And we, are, we have led a couple of uh, discussions at the United Nations and the General Assembly resolutions where recently 143 uh, member states of the United Nations condemned the Russian aggression and annexation or alleged annexation. Um, and that in part is also um, due to German diplomacy. Mr. Consul General, thank you so much for joining us today. We really, really appreciate your thoughts. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next week on another episode of Global Perspectives.